and welcome to this service of online worship at the American International Church. Wherever you find yourself this day, we are glad that you are joined up with us in spirit as we turn to praise and give thanks to God together. The earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all that lives in it. The Lord made the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for us to cultivate. The Lord brings forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens our hearts, oil to make our faces shine, bread that sustains our hearts. The Lord makes springs pour water into the valleys. It flows between the mountains. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Almighty Creator God, into your hands are the seeds of life, and you have blessed us abundantly. May we, in whom the seeds have grown, bear the fruits of love and generosity. May we sow that others may reap and rejoice in a harvest of plenty. For the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I invite you to take a moment and share Christ's peace with someone near or far, the person sitting next to you or someone across the world by email or text message. The peace of Christ be with you as we join up with our service here in the sanctuary. One, two, three. As it is written in the law. 
We also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and of every fruit tree. As it is also written in the law, we will bring the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, of our herds, and of our flocks to the house of our God, to the priests ministering there. Moreover, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, the first of our ground meat, of our grain offerings, of the fruit of all our trees, and of our new wine and olive oil. And we will bring a type of our crops to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. A priest descended from Hera is to accompany the Levites when we receive the tithes. And the Levites are to bring a tenth of the tithes up to the house of our God, to the storerooms of the treasure. The people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of bread, new wine and olive oil, to the storerooms, with articles for the sanctuary and for the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the musicians are also kept. We will not be glad the house of our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Go. 
God, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Great energy this morning from the back corner. I like so, I was not much bigger than that, maybe eight or nine years old, when my father first sat me down and taught me how to play poker. No, he wasn't a vicar, he was a lawyer, it's okay. <laughs> However, and, and I thought it was a great game, you know, we had a, an old copy of Hoyle's Rules, and I remember sitting on the floor in the family room with it open to read, look at my cards and figure out what it, what it had, and I thought it was cool names, like a flush and a royal and a, and a full house. Those were cool things to be thinking about, and I thought it was a great game. But my father, you're right, was a deeply faithful Christian Methodist man and didn't have high regard for gambling. So we didn't bet. And I don't mean like we played for pennies or M&Ms or paper clips or, you know, any of those other sort of workarounds that you have for, for playing poker where it doesn't really matter. I mean, there was no betting involved. You got your hand, you got your hand, you decided if you're keeping cards or throwing them away, and then you saw who won. And then you moved on. That was the game. It was fun, I thought. It was about as exciting as the other games I played at that age. Old Maid, Go Fish, Rummy, all those other ones that we played. It wasn't until I was an adult that I actually sat down at a poker table and realized that there was more to the game than that. I just thought, you know, you took your hand and you decided to bet and, and you either got it or you didn't and you moved on, but no. There's all kinds of things that happen that change fundamentally the nature of the game. Once you have to put a little money on the table, once you have to weigh in each round and decide if you're going to stay at that level, raise a little bit, fold and back away and just count your money lost, even the option of going all in, really raising the stakes in the chance to get a big win. All of a sudden, it went from a really quick turnaround game about who had the best cards to an investment in the relationships with the other people sitting around the table. Getting to know them and how they were going to react and, and starting to understand your own risk. And it's just cards. There's really no risk involved. Which brings me to Nehemiah, surprisingly enough. We've been following along for six weeks in this long story of Ezra and Nehemiah, who had been with the people in exile in Babylon for 70 years and then come back into Jerusalem, tasked to rebuild. Freed by the king of Persia, even funded to go build up the temple and the walls and the altar and all the rest. But they hadn't just been rebuilding the buildings. They'd been trying to knit together the community, reinstituting practices of worship, renewing people's covenant and participation in the law, emotional recovery by, by weeping and lamenting and then celebrating and rejoicing with festivals together all about bringing the community together. And over all of this story was the grace and the mercy and the never-ending love of God, just pouring out over them. All of this restoration and rebuilding only possible because of God's enormous generosity. Well, we get to this point in the story And in order for the community to grow, in order for the temple to thrive, in order for worship to happen and life to go on rebuilding, the leaders, Ezra and Nehemiah, look around at one another with all the other leaders, and they listen to God, and they listen to all that God has done to be generous to them, and they look out over in the people and say, this is going to work, it's time for you to put your 
your money on the table. If we're really going to rebuild the community, we can't do it without commitment from everybody. We need you to invest. Now, this, believe it or not, doesn't feel so radical to us. We're used to attending churches where you pass the offering plate, you put your offering in, you hear the preacher talk a couple of times a year about money, you're probably already going, oh, not today. She's going to do it again. Some of you anyway. But in Nehemiah's day, this was a major shift from what had come before. See, in the previous era, the temple was funded and controlled by the king. So, yeah, the people footed the bill, but they did it by taxation at the end of a spear from the king's army going around making collections. This is the first time that it was ever made voluntary, ever made an investment that you yourself were invited to give. And so they surveyed all the families and said, this is what we need. We need money for the wood. We need money for the building. We need contributions to, to help the temple go of wine and oil and all the rest of the things that make things run. Before they asked, they recounted all the generosity of God, all the things that God had done, and said, this time, we're not coming at you with the point of a spear in the king's army. We're not levying a tax that you have to pay. You've come to Jerusalem from the land of Babylon of your own volition. You have, you have come to be a part of this rebuilding. And the king funded us for a good long time. But if we want to worship, if we want to carry on, we need you. But here is the thing. It wasn't about what the temple needed. It wasn't about what the church needs now. It wasn't about God's need for their cash. It was about what they needed to grow in their spiritual lives. Kind of like playing poker. If you're just playing cards, and you're not risking anything. It's a really fun game for children. And it's a bit shallow. In this instance, the people need to step forward in their level of commitment, not just because the temple needs it, but because our spiritual vitality depends on our ability to commit to God and to one another. And so what the leadership says is, will you sign in? Will you make a pledge? That's actually the word they use, make a pledge. Now, let me tell you, we're not in the middle of our giving season right now. There are no pledge cards in the pulpit that are coming out today. But it is exactly what is asked of the people at the end of Nehemiah. Having borne witness to all the good things that God has done, will you join in? Will you invest some of what you have and what you are? Not just your money, but your labor, your commitment, your attendance, your presence, so that we can really rebuild and reunite. Because in order to grow in our faith, we have to grow in our commitment. We have to grow in our investment. I think a lot of us think about our participation in church life 
It's something we kind of come, out and come and go from. I want the church to be there when I need it, but I don't think much about it the rest of the time. Some of us think about our offering like a tip. Good week, God. A little extra for you. Thanks. That's very much how the ancient Israelites had always given their offerings. There was a, a tax that they had to pay according to the king that was taken out whether they wanted to or not. And then there were free will offerings and gifts and sacrifices that they made on the side. Prayer of praise for a new baby, make an offering at the temple. Need some forgiveness, make an offering at the temple. Have to offer prayer for healing, make an offering at the temple. This faithfulness had existed, and it will exist among us, and that is a good place to start. But what Nehemiah is getting to at this point is to say that if you want to have a growing and thriving community, if we want this house of worship to thrive and grow and be vital and to reach out to people from near and far, we're going to need some folks that are committed to make it happen. Folks who are ready to take that next step. Ready to move beyond the child's play version and into the risky one. Ready to live a faith that costs something. Ready to hang with it. Because this is a commitment that lasts when things are not easy. Whether that's not easy at home or not easy at the church. A community of people willing to take responsibility on their shoulders who say at the end of their pledge, we will not neglect the house of God. We will not abandon God's house. We will take responsibility for it. Because when that happens, God's house grows and thrives and God's work grows and thrives. And every one of their individual lives, their faith expands, their heart expands, their calm and Peace and faithfulness expands. As we reunite and rebuild after our year and a half of scattering and lockdown and pandemic, that is a question for each of us and for our community. Who will step forward? Many of you looking out already do and already have. Who else will take a new step of faith for the first time, an increased step of faith for another time? Whether it's financial or a leadership role or a new volunteer commitment. Let me tell you, the game is a lot better a lot more exciting and a lot richer when you're willing to risk to invest in it. Thanks be to God. Amen.
informed about the ministries of the church and so that we can connect with you more deeply. There are cards in the back that you can fill out with your information for us, or there's a QR code in the bulletin if you prefer to scan that on your smartphone and complete that online. Uh, today, after our fellowship time, our children are invited to stay for activities and a, a Sunday school lesson after church. We will meet indoors uh, today, but I checked the park, which is our, our nice weather option, and it's a bit soupy still. So, uh, we will be indoors downstairs, finishing at about 2 o'clock. We are having fellowship hour after church. On your way out of the sanctuary, we invite you to get a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and a biscuit. Make your way down the stairs and visit with us for just a bit. If you're a parent wondering when to send your children with me. We'll fellowship for a little bit and then I'll, I'll round up in a little bit. If you're joining us in worship next week, uh, know that we are having a special uh, music Sunday where we are singing Vivaldi's Gloria. Did I get the right Scott? Yes, Vivaldi's Gloria with uh, a volunteer orchestra and our AIC choir. So if you're able to make it to church next Sunday, don't miss that. That will be a wonderful time of worship for as we so often get to enjoy. Let's continue to worship today, though, as we, as we have been reflecting on today, give back of ourselves and of our worship by blessing God in the music that we are going to sing and through our financial gifts. There's an offering plate on the back for you, in the back for you to give as you leave the sanctuary today, or of course you can give by bank transfer. Details are in the bulletin or on the website. But let us give back to God through singing together.
talked about poker. <laughs> Tell them we talked about what it means to put your whole life out there, to invest in your relationship with Christ, to invest in a worshiping community, to let God's blessings flow through you and back out into the world everywhere you go. As you go out from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and always. Amen.